And so this light bulb went off and I was like, man, what if, what if the business is still helping companies generate revenue? Welcome everybody here to today's interview with B2B video marketing expert, Alex Sheridan. We're going to be talking about repurposing your video content like a pro um, from an expert himself who does this and trains teams um, both, uh, I'm sure on the outsourcing front, but also internally about how to create winning video marketing and social media strategies. So welcome everybody here to today's interview. We got about an hour blocked off for today, but definitely have some time for questions and answers. Um, and Alex is going to be jumping up here in just a second to join us, um, knowing that this month in April is our Omni Channel Challenge, where we're taking our existing video content and assets and then repurposing those across other channels. And so I wanted to see if Alex would be open to coming and sharing with us, which he is. I'm going to bring him up to the stage and uh, having an open conversation to kind of about what he's up to in the world of B2B video marketing and uh, and otherwise. But Alex... Thanks for being here. Appreciate you having me, Darby. Yeah, we uh, might have sent you some some new uh, connections on LinkedIn um, as I posted some of your uh, your recent posts inside of our community. Um, but would love to kind of hear um, from you who you are, what you do, and kind of like your experience in this field of video marketing over the years. So I, I came from a sales background. I was traditional B two B sales. I did that for about ten years, building territories up from zero to contest winning territories, and um, started getting exposed to video in about. 2019, where I started posting content on LinkedIn, videos in particular. And I was really trying to build my side hustle at the time, which I thought was going to be sales consulting and coaching. And as I started posting the videos, I just noticed this weird thing happen that happens over time when you start posting video content, which is that your prospects and your dream clients start actually coming to you versus you having to hunt them down, which is really all I did in sales. And so this light bulb went off and I was like, man, what if what if the business is still helping companies generate revenue, but instead of sales coaching and sales training and strategy, it's more this new thing, which is video content and LinkedIn and social selling. And so from there, it happened pretty fast. I won my first customer in February, 2020. Six months later, I was leaving my corporate job, taking the side hustle as a full-time business. And uh, the rest is really history. We've now we're helping companies build video into their business as a 24 seven sales rep for their business. Um, and of course, AI is changing a lot in terms of how we do it. So, yeah. And, you know, especially, you know, like the last few months and seeing some of the new changes with TikTok and going, it seems even just the last few weeks, I've been seeing more conversation around uh, TikTok style feeds yep. on, on LinkedIn. And it seems like over the last few years, platforms like TikTok have grown up in, in a certain, a few ways that it's becoming a little bit more serious. It's not just the dancing platform. Like people are going to the search and connect with people through video. And so the purpose of where the community is at right now and why I wanted to reach out to you um, initially was because we're all about repurposing content and getting content out there that most of us are in the B2B space in some way, shape or form. Can you give us kind of like the outline overview of what is like a video process look like to do this effectively? But also you said consistency is key here because if you just post a video, and then shy away, don't post anymore. You're not going to see that compounding effect. But like, what's the general process that you work through um, for yourself, for clients, for getting something like a system like this up to speed? And maybe for someone that's just starting out with B2B video marketing, like some tips that you find that make it not quite as overwhelming for someone just getting into it. Yeah, so I think there's the philosophical kind of things that I'll touch on really quickly from more of a mindset perspective. Then you've got the strategies and then you've got what I would call tactics and techniques, right? And so we can get into any and all of this. The first thing that people need to understand is that when you think about video content creation, people think that it takes time and it actually creates time because what you can do is scale yourself. You can multiply yourself by 10, 20, 50, 100 times. And we'll get into how to do that. But what I'm a big fan of is not only you don't have to always create the content, you are the content. So you can actually just become the content. And so a good example, a, a live example of that this right now is I'm just recording what we're doing here. I know you guys are recording it. You're going to use the internal call, right? And you're going to probably distribute it, edit it, whatever you're going to do. But what I'm doing off to the side here is I've got my smartphone. I've got a wireless mic. I've got a ring light um, and two other supporting lights on the side. And so I'm going to go ahead and record this entire conversation. So I am effectively being the content. I'm not having to go outside or 
you know, go to my studio and record five to 10 videos, even though I'm a big fan of doing that, I think content creation is important. It's an important skill to build. It's a different interaction that you have with your audience that you absolutely need to leverage. But my thing is we're having these conversations throughout the day, guys. Like we're on meetings, we're on client calls, we're doing events, virtual, in person. The thing that most people are missing is they're just not capturing it. They're just not recording and being intentional about hey, I'm doing this virtual event or live event, or I'm having this really in-depth call with this client, I can just record myself and have a basic setup. And that's probably the first place I would start is just get your setup right. And so nowadays I encourage people, it's like, all you really need is a smartphone. You don't need a fancy camera, DSL, mirrorless camera, none of that stuff. If you want that, that's great. You also don't need a super fancy mic. At minimum, you have a stationary mic, right? This is a Rode mic I'm using here, the stationary one, and it's 99 bucks. Below that, I've got a nicer Rode wireless mic, but there's a ton of models that you can get for 89 bucks, 100 bucks, 150 bucks. And so now you've got two mics. So I'm recording myself through you guys with the stationary, and then I've got my wireless that's plugged up to my smartphone. So after this, I've got the whole video that I can go ahead and repurpose. So that's the first thing is like, understanding that mindset shift. It's the biggest thing that companies and people I think haven't adjusted to because video is kind of if you think about it, video is fairly new in terms of how we use it today with video content and LinkedIn just rolled it out in I think 2018. So it really hasn't been that long guys. I mean, vertical short form video really hit the scene with TikTok hard. And probably what 2020 2019. I mean, it's only been a few years. So the first thing is like, let's just think about how we can embed video throughout our days throughout our weeks. And then we start getting into the actual process of repurposing videos, which I don't want to go too long without you stopping me, Darby. But if you want me to get into the process, I definitely can. Yeah, well, we'll get into the process for sure. But I think like the the shift you're talking about here is really important that we're already probably doing a number of these activities that we just aren't necessarily leveraging. We're leaving opportunity on the table because we're not capturing these moments that are already happening in our lives. And so it come, comes down to just a bit more preparedness, it seems, and and maybe being a little bit more strategic with the time that you are going to be spending on these meetings and knowing that, hey, I can pull actionable, valuable content from the time I'm already going to be spending here. And outside of going and scheduling a four hour block to film the specific type of content, can you talk to me where that type of content fits into how you approach this game, as well as like the you are the product of the content? Um, and kind of what you mean a little bit more by that? So when you create content from scratch versus, you know, what I would call documenting the content or being the content, it is it is nice because you get you get to laser in on your audience, right? You get to be very intentional with what you're going to say that first couple sentence or first sentence, really, which is the hook of the video. And you need that to grab attention, real people in and get them to watch the rest of the video. So when you create something from scratch, it's a little bit more artsy, right? Where the documentation is more real life. It's more like reality TV versus something that's been scripted like an actual show or a movie, right? Where you're like, wow, they put some intentionality into this. They've, they were really um, thoughtful about what they said in the first couple seconds. There may even be cases where for me, for example, I do some edutainment. So edutainment is combining educational content with entertainment. Why would I do that? Because I want my audience to be more entertained and, and grab their attention and retain their attention as I teach them something that has to do with my business, my area of expertise, and of course, my offerings. So with the content creation, you're much more dialed in, you can write things down, you can write bullet point things, you can say, you know, I want to add in this part that I think might make it a little bit more entertaining, or more funny, or more punchy, whatever the case may be. When you're doing this stuff, you're really just conversational, right? Mm -hmm. So now you can be an intentional and say, all right, how do I answer this question in a way that gives me a little bit more of a hook at the beginning, there's tactics that we can do but it's much less art and it's more reality TV when you're doing this versus creating the actual content or the show, which you'd be doing from creating the content. Do you feel like there's like an element or like an art to this in the same way that you might be getting good or better at improv? Like the more conversations you have, the more comfortable you get, the more that skill kind of builds, but just applied to Zoom interviews and connections with clients and just a different perspective. A hundred percent, man. Absolutely. It's definitely a skill that you build in the same way that I would say, you know, public speaking is a skill that you would build. And maybe you would craft the presentation or the keynote. You would certainly put together thoughts and things like that. But probably afterwards, there's an element of Q&A where it would be a little bit more, you know, impromptu, right? 
And so you wouldn't be prepared for that. They would just ask you a question and you'd have to answer that. Well, if it's your first one doing it, you might not be as thoughtful with how you answer it or how in depth you go. Maybe you're a little bit nervous even doing it. Where if you've done enough keynotes and presentations and things like that, you're pretty much just riffing like you're talking to a friend. So in both cases, there is definitely a level of skill that you build within those, which is why I encourage people to do both. And the reality is sometimes your audience wants to see the behind the scenes of you talking to somebody where they get to see you in a different light of you just talking in a conversation. It really kind of reveals more of your personality, your talking style, like you're just they're just peeking in on a conversation similar to what we would be doing with the Joe Rogan show or the diary of a CEO all of these conversations, we're just kind of looking in, into a window and saying, wow, this is kind of cool. We get to see this conversation between these two people or these three people, and we get to see what this is like and what they're talking about and the back and forth. But then you've got the original content creation, which is I'm going to talk directly to my audience right now, and I'm going to address them with something that I think is very important to them. And I'm going to be more intentional, and I'm going to laser in on that specific topic. And I can stop and pause or go. I can rewrite. I can mess up and redo the line. I've got more freedom and direction from the art standpoint, but you lose a little bit of that. I don't want to say you lose authenticity, but you lose the realness of the in in the moment of the documentation content. Yeah, I feel like now, especially with how much noise just continues to perpetuate with AI and, and otherwise that authenticity and being able to show up and be a real human on camera is going to gain that much more value um, kind of across the board because people want to right buy from those they like know and trust but you know i feel like if you're almost too scripted all the time then that yeah. in some cases puts in the back of my mind like well like i never see this person not perfect like what is right what is exactly that? and it's the same way that we're interested in musicians and, and actors and actresses we're interested in sort of the behind the scenes or the bloopers or the interviews that they might have after or before during production of whatever they're making. It's it's the same thing we want to see there, right? We want to see, and even in the presidential debates, we want to see them not on a scripted, you know, state of the union or an interview or something that they've set up and had time to prepare for. But we also want to see how they interact back and forth behind the scenes when it's a little bit more off the cuff, right? So yeah, I think it adds a little, it adds a level of depth to you as a content creator when you're able to leverage, you know, a few different types of content. When we're talking about the types of content, so we've touched on like kind of talking head interview, you can pull this stuff that's unscripted, and then like kind of the more prepared scripting of the hooks and doing it a little bit more structured. Where we start our content process here at Gen AI University is through a process called the buyer's brief, which is just getting a really in-depth understanding of a specific target market. And how are you going to like create content that speaks to their goals, their dreams, their fears, you know, what's keeping them up at night. When you're going about crafting hooks for content, do you take any sort of approach where you're kind of obviously you do audience research and you're 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 testing things with your market and you're you're putting content out and getting that feedback loop. Is there anything that you're doing when you're doing, I, you might call it something else, imagine social listening when you're on in the comment section, you're doing it that you find is useful for how you go about creating these hooks and inspiring the types of videos based on what you're hearing in the comments and in the kind of the, the social atmosphere on LinkedIn or other profiles? Yeah, it's really just two things. It's listening to your point. It's it's watching and observing and listening to what how people are reacting to certain types of content, whether that be your own or whether that be someone else's that you saw and you said, wow, that was into this post got a lot of engagement, looks like that first line really worked, or I love the way that they shot this, but they filmed it almost from a behind the scenes type of view versus a talking head type of view. That's interesting, right? Or, oh, there's a skit video that worked really well. Why did they change characters in the first couple seconds that really retained my attention? So I think it's studying, it's listening to the comments of what people say, it's watching your own post and saying, wow, this line really resonated with somebody, right? And you can always tell when they put it that line in the comments. I've had people say like, oh, video doesn't take time, it creates time. That's an interesting mindset flip, right? Mm -hmm. Or don't, you know, don't always create content, you can actually be the content or video is a 24 seven sales rep for your business. When people start repeating that stuff back to you, it lets you know that it's one, it's stuck in their mind. And two, it's something that probably resonated with them. So that's the first part. The second part is you just got to be willing to try new things, right? Because you're not always going to get, hey, this is the exact hook that you should use in the next video, or this is exactly what we think is going to work. You got to listen and take the feedback, 
look what other people are doing, constantly learn. But then you have to be willing to take that leap and say, let me try this hook out. I think it's going to work. And to your point, Dar Darby, we start in the same place. You got to start with your who you're talking to and your customer, your target audience, your dream client, knowing exactly who they are, demographics, psychographics, fears, desires, concerns, um, all, all insecurities, all that stuff. But so I think it's a combination between those two, really listening and taking the feedback, but also being bold and not being scared to try something new, because that's oftentimes where the best hooks and ideas and frameworks come from. Yeah. And it's, it, the third thing I'll just say really quickly yeah, go is, ahead, go ahead. And, and you'll love this one, Darby, is you can also leverage AI. So we've got mm -hmm. some prompts, right? Where we say, hey, and I don't just say, hey, create me a hook for you know, a LinkedIn video or a TikTok video, because we all know that's not going to work, right? They're not probably going to give you something very good. But if we were to dial it in and we were to say, hey, I'm looking to create a one-liner hook for a video about this, this, and this. Here's my target audience. And by the way, here's what good hooks look like. They should be this, this, and this. And here's 15 examples of hooks I've used in the past that have worked really well. Can you design 20 more hooks based on a video about X, Y, and Z? And so... Since you know you're Mr. AI, I want to make sure we include that. <laughs> yeah, that's that what I was going to be uh, kind of segueing into with that 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 section, right? We're using AI, but if you just use AI and don't actually go and test out your assumptions or the the content that AI is making, then yes, you, you'll never get those insights that are going to actually inform the content you are making. But also to get out there to kind of be bold and do something that makes you uncomfortable is often where a lot of the growth the growth will come from. And again taking that those insights back, then once you know your frameworks and once you know kind of this is the stuff that tends to work because I've been testing it for so long and or I just I know that this works because I've studied copywriting and I know that this is a great formula, right? Bringing those to the table with the insights from your market, really powerful combo. But again, super easy to just get, oh, I'm just going to have AI come up with these hooks. And then you wonder why it sounds like everyone else's hooks or... <laughs> It's not a good hook because AI that you might be using at that time isn't necessarily giving you, um, you know, the right framework, the right structure or content that you want. Another thing I'll just add on this too, from us more of a content strategy standpoint is there's knowing your customers, which is very important, right? Their pain points or desires, fears, and securities and tailoring content to your customer. But it's content is more than just knowing your customer. It's also what is your unique differentiators? what do you push back on in the industry that is different than what everyone else does? How do you approach solving the same problems that maybe are involved in your industry or with your clients and with your competitors' clients, but you approach them slightly different? What is the language that you use and that you bring to the marketplace that people say, I've never heard that before. That's really interesting the way that you said that, or I've never heard of a strategy like that before. Tell me more about that. So I think it's like, cause oftentimes I hear like, go make tips, go bring value to your audience, go make videos about, you know, that help solve your customers' problems. Yes, 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 yes. That's all great. But the differentiation part is key. We've got to break through the social media noise. So if I just put out generic tips around video marketing, you know, create a hook, do this, have a strategy, everyone's saying that. So how can I enter the marketplace and say something different? Like, you can actually position video as a 24 seven sales rep for your business. Really? How can I do that? Well, we've got a framework. Let me show you what it is. So now I've just, what we call that is owning the language and driving the language. And I heard that from someone I would consider a mentor, Marcus Sheridan. Um, but that's really important to think about as you go through this process too, is, is how are you differentiating yourself? Yeah, we can't forget that. And in the things that you're repeating back that you say your audience is reading back to you brings up a book that um, I was introduced to a few months ago called, uh, I think it's called Microscripts. I don't know if you, you're familiar with that book, mm -hmm. uh, but he talks about that, like when the, the best brands or like the jingles that get stuck in your head are like, totally. if your audience is repeating back to you the words that are sticking, then it's actually sticking and you know it is and so you hear like blanking on ones on top of my head but you kind of you you said a couple of them where people start to echo the things that you're saying in the comments and then that's a good indicator that maybe this is a path that i need to continue exploring yeah if we look at you know donald miller has the story brand grant cardone's 10x you know um you've got nike just do it mcdonald's i'm loving it you've got from you know and even down to smaller micro creators you've got a lot of different things um, and even on a, on a broader scale, like uh, Kleenex, we don't say pass me a, 
you know, a tissue. It's usually past me a Kleenex. If a kid falls on the ground or an adult <laughs> and we, you know, they scrape their knee, we don't say, please hand me an adhesive bandage. We say, do you have a Band-Aid? So we're embedding these, again, we're owning the language and embedding these in the minds of our customers. And so you can see it again, it doesn't need to be some massive company. I'm seeing, I watch it play out every day on LinkedIn where people see a new framework or a new idea or philosophy or strategy or tactic, and now they're using it. And then that becomes adapted in the industry to a certain extent. And guess what happens when you're the OG that adapted that language in the industry, people look up to you. And that's typically when people start writing books about it. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and so with a lot of where we've talked about today is around kind of your philosophy with you being the content and the different types of content that you can create, but also being strategic. And I've seen in your posts recently um, about the framework that you walk folks through to get the most out of the content and to like, like just being more strategic in general with it. Is there a process that you find is effective in terms of videos where you can go through and shoot the certain videos like to make the most of the time, I guess, um, that you are creating that content or like an outline idea, mm -hmm. outline conclusion that you find is really effective for repurposing those, those pieces of content. So we, for, so I've got one for content creation, which is something we call the gems framework. And I can go through that for repurposing one, one of the biggest things and the biggest mistakes that people make with repurposing their videos is it's an afterthought. Meaning they make a long form video, they're a guest on a podcast, they shoot something, they're on an event, someone gives them the you know recording of it. Do you want the recording? Yeah, I'll take the recording, we'll get some content from it. And now they've got this long form piece of content and they say, okay, well, what should we do with it? And it's like, well, the thought should have been in, what do we do with it prior to making the long form video? So what I say is, hey, before you're going to create something, whether it be a, a session like this, right? You're on a live session with somebody, virtual session, whatever it is, whether it's a podcast, whether it's um, anything that you're really doing, right? Client call, it doesn't matter. You want to think about beforehand, how might, first of all, my setup to get the content myself or with the person I'm recording on. So I don't make sure it's good quality content, audio, video, lighting, all that stuff. But secondly, what are my goals? What am I trying to do with this content? Am I trying to make it into a long form YouTube video or you know, an episode for a podcast? Am I trying to just get micro short form vertical videos? What are my goals and objectives of this recording that I'm going that I'm about to do? And then from there, you want to think about obviously you want to think about do you have an editor or do you have an editing solution, a process for that? You know, typically we'll use like something like a Trello board to organize raw content that comes in and then it goes through a few different cards, comes out the other side as edited videos ready to post. But from there it gets tactical to where if you say, okay, let's say I'm on this event right now. Coming into it, I say, am I prepared? Do I have my equipment? Yes. Smartphone set, mic set up. Yes. Good audio, good video. Yes. Now, tactically, I need to make sure that when I'm answering questions, I'm reminding myself that I'm recording this. So instead of, and here's a great example. If Darby asked me, hey, what's the biggest question or what's the biggest mistake that B2B companies are making right now with video? If I were just to not think about repurposing and not have this in my mind, I may just answer the question and say, well, it's probably a couple of different things. One of them might be, problem is I can't use that now for a video. If I do, I got to re-change, I got to change the hook, trim it, move something to the front because I can't start a video off saying, well, I think it's a couple of different things. Boop, they're going to scroll right past that. They have no clue what the hell I'm talking about, right? There's no context and the feed's competitive and they're going to go right to the next video. But if instead because I've trained my mind to think about my repurposing strategy and how I answer these questions, I just simply ask the question back or throw out the question back. And I say, the number one mistake that B2B companies are making with video right now is X, Y, and Z. Well, now I've got the start to the hook for that clip. And then I answer the question and that becomes the video. And the next time he asks, asks him a question, I try to reframe it again, reframe it, reframe it again. So if you're you know, on a podcast and you're asking the questions, you want to make sure the questions that you ask are hook worthy, let's call it, right? So from there, if you've done all of that, then you just get into the back half, which is the, you know, actually the, the tactical taking the video clips, time stamping them, moving them to editing, moving them to your Trello or Airtable or whatever you have set up. And then it kind of goes through that content workflow process. And then it's eventually posted videos. I like the, the thought behind the answering the questions that didn't doesn't strike me as like, oh yeah, of course that's what you should do. But you think about, you know, I was just at a, a 
an expo and the speaker was on stage and someone would ask the question in the crowd, but no one else could hear the question. And in, instead, and in, in this isn't just this speaker, it, this happens right all, all the time. Like you don't repeat the question back. Everyone's like, what is this guy talking about? What right. do you go to answer? Like that context at the beginning is so key. And I love how simple it can be is just repeating the question. The question is the hook. People that are interested in that question are more likely to move on down um, or watch the rest of the video. Are there any other really key mistakes that you find um, folks have when they're not being, or maybe like related to not being a strategic with the content? Like some of the top mistakes that you see folks that are maybe already producing a bunch of content, but they're just, they're just leaving opportunity on the table if they just made a few key tweaks. Yeah, it mostly just comes down to the, I mean, one, I don't think enough people are actually even doing it to begin with, but two, if they are doing it, it really just comes down to the preparation. And then I think they underplay how important the the value of the hook is. And so what I mean by hook is that, that first two to three seconds, that's literally all you have on social media these days. You know, if someone's going to watch a podcast or a movie or some other sporting event, they're going to give you hours. That's fine. Our attention spans aren't gone. It's just so competitive now. Mm -hmm. So we still have attention spans. They're just going a million different ways. Once we get on something that we really enjoy and we're bought into and want to watch or listen or read, we'll give it our time. The thing is you're competing. You're not just competing with other videos and other content. I hope you realize that. You're competing with every other app that is in that person's phone, meaning they got a text message. They're swiping right on Bumble, right? Like there, there's another app there on TikTok, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn. They're checking how much they're on their phone. They're... There's a million different, they're checking their stocks, their investments, their banks, their, their emails. So it's our, there's so much competition for our attention now that you really have to be very intentional with well, how do I open this up in the first couple of seconds to where it really does two things. One, it clues people into what the next things I'm about to say. It clues people into what the video is about. And then two, it intrigues them enough to where they would want to hear the rest of what you're going to say. So it's not enough to say, I'm going to talk for, you know, the next 60 seconds about AI and the disruption in marketing. Yeah, whatever, right? Like, yeah, that's a good, not a bad topic. It's just like the way you delivered it was like, it's not super intriguing versus if I said this one thing is going to change everything in the marketing world when it comes to AI. And now you're like, whoa, what is this thing? What is mm -hmm. this one thing? So it's those minor tweaks. And this is what I call content fundamentals. And I think it's one of the most overlooked things in marketing in today's day and era, today's day and age, is just they don't focus enough on the content fundamentals, the hook, the first couple of seconds, the what you say, how you say it, adding edutainment in there from time to time. Um, you know, the way that you write the copy, even with the video on LinkedIn is still very important. So what do you say in that first line on LinkedIn above the video? You can't say something like, check out this video of me and Darby talking to like, like, I don't care, right? Like, you got to give me a reason to want to check it out, right? So it's like, hey, don't make this mistake when it comes to repurposing your video. Here's how to take one video and get 20 videos from it. Well, that might grab someone's attention because now they might say, well, I'd love to get 20 videos out of one video. How do I do that? So it's all about the value that we're going to give to them. Again, just delivering it in a very intriguing package. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We've got some questions coming through also, Alex. Yeah, let's, if let's do it. I'd love to jump in. we got folks, guys, if you're here live with us, go ahead and drop your questions in. And um, we've got about 30 more minutes left um, to, to dig into what, what you guys have. So um, make sure you ask away while you're here. Um, first question is, are you ever re-recording just the hook and then cutting to your podcast um, or speech recording in the case you flood the hook or it needs adjustments? Um, does that make sense? It does. You know, let's say the hook wasn't in there from the actual clip of the podcast, I think is what they're saying. I think you absolutely can and even should do that if you need to. If it's a really good video clip that you want to get out, but the hook just isn't doing it. Because again, it doesn't matter what we say after the hook. If it's not there and it's not grabbing people's attention and reeling them in, you could say the greatest 50, 70, 80, 100 words that has ever been spoken in the human language. But if you didn't grab them in the first two to three seconds, it's, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there, does it make a sound, right? It's, it's like, no one, it doesn't matter. It's not, no one's going to see it. So I would, and I actually think there's some, there's actually some cool creativity that you can add in here too, 
where maybe it's you doing something unique with the scenery or how you film the first couple seconds, and then boom, it gets into the clip. So I actually think you could do it to fix a clip, but you could also do it to enhance a clip. Or maybe it, the hook is decent, but you still want to add an extra layer of the hook in the first couple seconds and then tie it back into the clip. So yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, and kind of related to that, and yeah, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but if you can kind of rerun through how you are automating or using AI inside of this cook, the hook ideation process. You mentioned a few ways that you approach it on the framework side. We can kind of like give a high level what that looks like again. Yeah, using hooks uh, or using AI to generate hooks. Basically, what I what I we have a few different templates, but it's it's something along the lines of I don't know word for word, but it's you, you gotta and I usually prompt it with, hey, you're a content creator. You know, if it's on LinkedIn, let's say you're a dynamic content creator on LinkedIn that is, you know, one clients and gained, you know, tens of thousands of followers here. You're very experienced at doing things like clickbaity type, you know, content and getting attracting customers and things like that. I'll frame it up with something like that. And then I'll say, Hey, I want you to create a one liner or two liner hook for me for a video that I'm getting ready to create. And it's about X, Y, and Z, or it's a podcast podcast clip about X, Y, and Z. And then I say, here's what we do for our business. Here are the customers we're trying to attract. And it's not just we're trying to attract CEOs is we're trying to attract, you know, CEOs of seven to eight figure businesses that don't yet have a you know chief marketing officer that are starting to post on LinkedIn, but are not quite figured out how to make it work for them. You know, I'm giving it some context. And then I'm saying, uh, so create the hook. And by the way, here's 15 examples um, of those hooks of hooks that have worked in the past. I want you to recreate 20 more based on this topic. And that's pretty much it. You can rephrase that a bunch of different ways. For folks that aren't quite ready to hire a video editor. What mm -hmm. would you say is the minimum level of production level that you would want to shoot for for a scripted content, B-roll, music, multiple camera angles before not hiring a full idiot, video editor, maybe just like you as a solo creator? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest video editing solution is AI now, right? Where we have things like Opus Clip, uh, Descript, uh, the bare minimum is auto captions. And the crazy thing is most social platforms have that built into the actual app now. Mm -hmm. So you really almost don't even need the software. Right. So this is where I think people get hung up with video is they start overthinking like, oh, I don't know, have an editor. I don't know the editing style. I don't know that it does not matter. No one's probably going to see your first 10, 20 videos anyways. So practice what I, again, what I call the content fundamentals, get good at you opening up the video the right way with that intrigue in the first couple seconds, you delivering a message that is both powerful, valuable, but also uh, powerful and valuable, but also um, it's, it's not too long, but it's not too short. It's really in that sweet spot. Um, and you get really good at those things and auto captions is fine for now. Um, or using something like an Opus clip is great for plugging in long form videos or even short form now, I believe. And it'll auto caption the entire video for you. And I think if they've not already, they've got B roll that's coming where you can add your own B roll in there. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of really cool things that happens with AI. I think they're going to replace the the basic editors. And I think the really good editors are going to transform into more creative directors. I, I agree with you there. And I, yeah, I just saw yesterday something about getting approved to start testing out the B-roll on Opus. And so I haven't yet, but you know, it seems to be the way to go with just AI video generation or the numbers of B-roll out and there. That, now that being said, I have full-time video editors that I apply, right? Because they can do more than just edit the video. Like we just are launching a new podcast in a few weeks called The Founder Talk, and it's interviewing founders and their stories and that kind of stuff. And I hired somebody full time that I basically just give the raw video to, and he's gonna he's gonna you know make sure the long form is good for the podcast. He's gonna chop up and find the micro clips in there because Opus Clip they do that for you, but it, they, sometimes they don't pick the right clips or the hooks yeah. not as good. So it, again, it's we're very early on. I think it's good for now, but it's gonna be a lot better. And then he's able to go through and create a trailer for each episode. So it's really intriguing. He'll get the 30 second glimpse of what the episode's about. I mean, he's doing all of this. AI cannot do that, right? Maybe in, in some point in the future, I'm sure it might be able to, but for now it can't. Um, and then if you want next level editing, right? It might be a good idea to get an editor where that you could have more creative freedom. But I think absolutely don't let that get in the way of your of you creating videos, especially in the beginning. Yeah, I think especially for just the practice and repetition and consistency, sure. getting it easy using something like Opus, there's so much value to working with someone that gets it and can help also do the things that aren't your plate. Because if it, if you're Alex, you don't want to be behind the the desk of a you know Descript work you know right. editing space for 20 hours a week. I mean, maybe you do, and that's no. like 
what your your superpower is, but then it's like, okay, what really, what's the unique value that you're bringing? And if you are the content and the product, then you need to be producing content and like getting out there and making the connections, putting the podcasts um, together and that sort of thing. And working with clients and it's scaling, growing yeah. your business, you know? So it's like, you know, you're just trading a little bit of money for time. I mean, everyone talks about time is our biggest asset and the number one thing that we have, yet I don't see enough people leveraging it. So um, to me, it's it's the growing your business 101. What can I take off my plate and pay someone else to do a reasonable wage for them to be able to do so I can go earn more and grow the business? Absolutely. And can you give some tips for when you're out there and creating the content, how you add edutainment in uh, for those that may be coming off a little bit more dry or straightforward with video? Is there anything that you found useful? I mean, your own tool belt for kind of that education, edutainment mix that you talk about. So the the simplest way to make edutainment in terms of, you know, edutainment videos is what I call the sprinkle method. And so all it is, is you're sprinkling a little bit of edutainment in a video. And I'll give you an example here. So, you know, let's just say you're like, oh, I'm not that funny or I'm not that like charismatic. I don't know how, I, I don't think I could make edutainment videos, right? It's not in me. Well, it really is. I've seen just about everyone doing it. And it, it's actually, I think sometimes it's more funny when the personality is a little bit drier because it actually just comes across, like it's just, it adds a whole other flavor and uniqueness to it that I think someone that's a little more charismatic, you, you kind of lose that with. So I think your your personality it doesn't you got to play to your personality. If you're quirky, if you're a little funny, if you're awkward, like these are all good things that you want to play to in the video and it's also your uniqueness. But let's say you were making a video uh, about how to use AI but not sound like a robot. Right? So it could be you could for example, I'm just going to throw out a random example. You could start the video off and say, you know, hey, you want to start using AI in your content creation process, but you also don't want to sound like a freaking robot. And then you would just go whoop, whoop, or do like an edit and they could do something with that editing. But even you yourself could just, be, you know, act like a robot for a quick second. It takes two seconds. And it just not that it's the funniest thing in the world, but it just breaks up the monotony. It breaks up the uh, they're going to say something and say something. And here comes another sentence and another sentence in the same tone and the same delivery. It just breaks it up. Right. Same if I was talking about you know, people's content being boring, that it's putting people to sleep. And then I just flashed to me doing this. I'm like, huh? I'm sorry, what'd you say? Right. It's just something that's going to break up that scene and give people maybe a smile or a laugh or just keep them intrigued. We sometimes forget that humans are very emotional creatures. Mm -hmm. So if, if you can play to the emotional side in your videos first, and then keep them involved emotionally, but then on the middle to back end also have enough there intellectually and logically that they say, I really learned something with this. I, I never thought about it like that. I, I can now go solve this problem because of what they mentioned here. This is great. I built trust and credibility with this person. They're more likely to work with you now. So you're not only just reeling them in from an emotional standpoint, you're now actually convincing them that you're someone that can help solve their problems and that probably would be worth partnering with. When you're, as you're saying this, I'm thinking back to a video that I, I saw a few months ago from you where it was a skit and you were, I think it was between like the sales rep and the marketing rep. And like one person was mad that the other wasn't like hitting the goals and like the salesperson was mad at the marketing person. And then like the end, end of the video is about like a two or three minute skit. And I was like, well, why don't we like work together? And like, here's this new type of marketing. And I, I thought like, and you've done a few skits like that, but I thought that was a really interesting way to break through the ice. And it was like, you know, put on like a different t-shirt and some glasses and one clip. And then you're just like turning around and just filming yourself inside of yes. the skit. And it, like, I was like, that's genius. And like, I remember showing my fiance, I was like, Dude, this is hilarious. And she was cracking up too with it. But then I was like, yeah, like got the lesson from it too. It's a lesson. It's also very entertaining. Yes, there's, I appreciate that. And there, that's it. There's got to be a lesson, right? So people confuse entertainment with edutainment. They're like, we're going to do something silly and kind of funny or like a trend or whatever. That that may be fine, but that's typically more entertainment than edutainment. So and what you just mentioned there, Darby, is personification. I think that's one of that's more the, more of the advanced level edutainment, but it's one of the most powerful. So if you're doing a video and maybe you say, you know, Darby's doing a video and maybe he's doing a character with glasses or something that's the internet. And then another character with the backwards hat is AI and they meet each other. And AI is like, what's up, dude? Internet, you know, and internet's like, oh, nice. You had a new, new guy in town. Okay, yeah, cool. And he's like, yeah, you change things, but we're really about to change the world. And so you have this like little dialogue and there's some lessons and morals and things like that in there, but it's kind of funny to see that because you never, 
you don't see that, right? Like they're not people. So when you can personify, or even if it's like, um, you know, what I've done is, you know, to what Darby mentioned is like, you know, sales marketing, yes, but also I sometimes I'll play the CEO and I'll play a confused CEO that's talking to marketing and they're having all these problems. And so sometimes you can kind of play the part of your potential customer and point out some of the silly things that they're doing, but how to solve them too in the same video so that again, they see you as that that proven expert. And you know, like it clearly takes time to put those together. Like that yes. you're thinking through the script and doing it. So that's like a perfect example of like how like you're thinking through an entire skit, you're spending yes. time on it. But like some of those videos, I mean, you get hundreds of comments in it and like the shareability of those because it hits yes. the mark. And I mean, you didn't just come out with this out of that wasn't your first video doing this type of thing. Right. Practicing at it. Right. So well, and I think I think that's an, the other lesson here too yeah. is like the more time and effort that you put into your content, typically if you're getting better and building skills, the better it's going to perform. And I think some for some people that's like a shocker. It's like, oh, you mean the more that I focus on the content fundamentals and the hooks and the way I deliver my message and how sharp that message is and how dialed it in to my customer it is, the better it's going to perform. Yes, absolutely. Right. Just like the better that we work out, the better that we eat healthy, the better that we are at building a house, like the better the house is going to be. So it's like how much time, what's that balance of how much time and effort do I want to put into it right now um, versus how much time do I actually have? And then there's also the balance of like, you, you don't want to let prog or, uh, perfection get in the way of progress either, mm -hmm. where you're trying to make some epic video, the first five videos you've ever made, or you look at a creator that's been doing it for years and years and years and has really honed in on their craft and you're looking at them like, well, mine's not that good. Of course, it's not that good. Like Michael Jordan wasn't, you know, who he was at 35, you know, at 16. He was cut from the basketball team, but he honed his skills. He got better. He shot a lot of shots. He failed a lot of times and then got to a point where he's one of the greatest or some people would say the greatest. So I think that's important to note too. Yeah. And like not, yeah, just like, I mean, like I play baseball and so sports, right? You, you get a baseball and like if you hit. 300 fails seven times out of 10 you're like a hall of famer <laughs> no that that's so true dude yeah and yeah and like it takes it's so much practice and repetition to get that done um but like you said it's a skill and like every time you're practicing and focusing on building the skill i think that with that comes intention too because you can totally practice and build bad skills with video and like go you know maybe push yourself in a backwards direction if you're not being intentional and focused and have right. maybe some goals defined with it. And I think sometimes, and this is like a sort of segue into this question, like as you're flowing these out and you're getting to the point now where you have a team, are you knowing the content you want to film? Are you timestamping it yourself and like giving a lot of context as kind of the creative director when you pass it off through that? I think you use Trello for that, but there's a number of, of boards. Are you, how much time are you spending in preparing that content once you film it on the creative direction, on the time stamping, on the delegation of it? So you film an hour long video. Is that actually two or three hours of your time? Is that an hour and a half of your time? I'm just, just kind of curious where you, where you stand on that. Yeah. Great question. This is behind the scenes stuff that you don't get to see either. So it's interesting. So I'm spending much less time now curating and going through the content and time stamping and finding what clips and this and that, what's going to work here, what's going to work there. And instead, what I'm doing is I'm entrusting my team who the person that's doing this now for the podcast, as an example, he's been with me for over two years. So there's a lot of trust and credibility built up there. I believe in him. He's really creative and very talented. And I know he's capable of doing this. And it was part of me. There was part of me that needed to let go. That needed to say, hey, if you want to grow this thing and produce more content and grow your business and scale and accomplish your goals, you need to let go. You have to give people the opportunity to fail. And that's one thing if you're looking for an editor right now or a content director or social media manager, sure, you want to have standards. There needs to be a certain level of quality and expectations and commitments that they follow through. But you also need to let them fail. You need to let them say, I'm going to try something new here. Amazing. Try it. It didn't work out. Perfect. Great. We tried it though, right? So now let's, let's tweak a couple things. Let's move forward. So to answer your question, I was doing all of the time stamping. And all of the, which clips should we pull? How should we frame this? You know, with the podcasts that we're getting ready to launch, I would have been doing all of this. But now I'm starting to more and more say, here is this piece of content. And I want you to go through and you do what you think would be right for the trailer or for the micro clips or for the long form. Because what that's doing is now I'm, and I'm teaching and coaching along the way. So now what I'm doing is what I think a lot of people don't do 
with their their staff, especially when it's like outsourced and they're in different countries, Philippines, wherever it is, is they don't actually embed the skills in their people. It's very transactional. It's like, here's a video. Okay, I'll edit it. I want you to do this, this, and this. It comes back. Oh, caption was off. This do, hey, don't use this, use this. Meanwhile, they're just the same place six months later, 12 months later. They haven't actually built skills to where if you give it to them and you give them the creative freedom and the ability to fail and you're coaching and mentoring them along the way, after six to 12 months, they're kind of a mini version of you where they kind of start thinking like you now. And so I think that's a really important, now that we're working with, you know, seven and even eight figure businesses, we're having to come in and train their teams. They've got social media managers and content directors and video editors. So we've had to get really good at within the first couple months, getting these people trained up to where they're kind of thinking more like us, because right now they're posting content that's not working. It's not performing. So clearly things need to change. The other thing I'd want to hit on really quickly, Darby, is your point about just putting out the content is not, that's not the only solution. That's not the thing, right? So like, if I'm, like I'm going to get better because I've posted a hundred videos. Not necessarily. Like if, if the videos suck and you don't have a good feedback loop and you're not getting better at your content content fundamentals, you've just made a hundred videos that suck and now you still suck. So it's like, and we see that we come in, I came into a client recently, an eight figure business. They were doubling down on posting 10 posts a week on LinkedIn. I've been doing it for months. Performance was not good. Couple like handful of likes, no inbound leads. We brought them, I dialed it back. I said, guys, we're going to hit pause for a second because all this volume, and I feel like we get in this Gary V mode where it's like, you need to post five times a day and all these different platforms and repurpose everything. It's like, but not for most people in most companies, right? Sure, when you have your own team of 15 people for your personal brand, yeah, you do that. But when where you're at most people or most companies, they're not at that place yet. They need to learn the fundamentals, the process, how to create really great content that attracts their clients. Then they can scale up. So we come in, very first post that we create together is our highest performing post out of the last five months. And so because we focused on the content fundamentals, we had that we dialed in the strategy, we paused and said, it's not just about high volume. It's about we need to get better with time and have the right content that actually moves the needle forward for the business. Is there anything within that content that you found helps keep like the story or the narrative or people focused along, maybe like the question here is about pacing and um, like, as you're talking in it, do you find that there's certain levels of like how fast you're talking are a big enough factor or is it less about the pace of what you are, but it's more about what you're saying and how you're saying it and making sure that people are actually hooked into it? Yeah. I mean, I think there is a, like, I've been known sometimes to talk really fast, right? So sometimes I have to like, all right, slow down a little bit, mm -hmm. but I also think that we have to, again, play to our, natural personalities, our strengths, the things that make us us. I don't think we should try to change who we are. But there are times when, again, getting that feedback loop and saying, okay, I think I'm talking a little too fast. If I slowed it down, sometimes that's what you need to really drive that point home. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that pause like I'm doing now, right? There's sometimes where it makes that that's, that's a skill that you would work on, right? Or maybe you're talking too fast or too monotone. And it's like, hey, move your hands a little bit. Like, let's try and get you into it a little bit more, right? But I do think a lot of it comes down to, yes, what you're saying, who you're saying it to, and how you deliver that message for sure. Great. Any other questions, guys? We're coming up here in the last few minutes of the hour. Um, and so I want to be respectful of your time, Alex, make sure we don't go over. Um, we'll wrap things up here. If with a question about what's your business model, which from from the crowd, I don't know how, what, what sort of um, details you want to go in on that. I know you work with these businesses. And yeah, I'll give you the quick, the, yeah. the the simplest thing that I could explain is just we're a video content and social media strategy training and coaching company. So we work with seven and eight figure businesses, B2B companies to help them leverage video as a 24 seven sales rep for their business. So we don't do the marketing. We we believe that's one of the things that we push back. Talk about what you got to push back on things in your industry, right? And be, have your unique differentiators. One of One of ours is that we believe that the done for you marketing agencies are going to be extinct in a few years because now the technology is at your fingertips. It's less costly to do it internally. It's better performing when you do it internally. And we're typically using our iPhone and AI now. And so the tech is just there. So we help companies kind of build it internally for their company. I think internal is the way to go um, now, especially with having these systems and processes that you can inject mm -hmm. and train and be able to influence that marketing. How are you balancing maybe the temptation to spend too much time on, maybe this is, is one, one perspective, too much time serving a clients, but then still maintaining a minimum amount of content creation for marketing? Is there a, a balance that you find in your week that you've got 10 hours blocked off 
regardless of what happens, I'm filming content this week doing this stuff versus obviously servicing, delivering value for clients is, you know, a huge part of the equation. I think often the over like the the overwhelm with I need to always be creating content every week. <laughs> I need to be getting into this this process, the system. But then I get a handful of clients on one week and I, I don't market myself for three weeks. And then it's like crap. I I fell off there. So how do you balance maybe that that scale? How do I balance putting out my own content consistently, but also servicing clients and work and growing the business? Right. Yeah. That's a great freaking question, man. I'd say it's a few different things, right? So one, it is taking advantage of what we talked about earlier, which is being the content. If you're not good at documenting the things that you're doing throughout the day, strategically, it doesn't need to be every single thing that you do. But if you're not good at getting some of the footage of you just doing your normal day-to-day -day stuff, or you're on a podcast, you're uh, talking to a client, you're talking to a team, whatever it is, if you're not doing that, it's tough because you're going to have to create everything from scratch now, which is a, that's a hurdle, right? So it's getting really good at that. Um, it's also, what I also do is I block out certain times and days. And for me, mostly it's Wednesday where I just block out a few hours and I say, I'm just going to set up my content for the week. I'm maybe going to record a couple videos for the podcast. We're doing an hour for the podcast recording on Wednesdays. So I don't take any meetings on Wednesdays. I also don't take any meetings on Fridays unless it's like a one-off. So I think it's important to set boundaries to say, this is just the me time or the content creation time. I, I need to keep this machine running because this machine is what got me to the point where I even had clients to work on in the first place. So I think it's like, never never forget what where you came from and what got you here, but also knowing what's going to get you to the next might be a tweaked version of that. The third thing is I'm also just okay taking a little bit of time off when I need it. That was a problem for me my first couple of years. I felt like if I was off LinkedIn for more than two or three business days, it's like the world was going to fall apart. And I think one of the muscle, one of the muscles that you develop from creating a bunch of content is truly separating yourself, the content creator, from who you are as a person. I am not my content. I'm not my videos. I'm not my business. I'm Alex Sheridan. I'm a father. I'm an entrepreneur, a bunch of other things. So the more I've done this now, and it's been over four years of consistently putting out videos and content, I've learned to let go. A post doesn't perform well. Who cares? But in the beginning, if I'm being honest, it would have gotten me down for a little bit. Not for weeks at a time, but for maybe that day or that few hours, I would have gotten a little bummed about it. Now, I don't give a shit. I've done this enough times. I've seen enough ups and downs and this and that. It's just part of the game. I take a few days off. No one's going to miss me. I'm not that special. All right. The world's not sitting around and be like, where's Alex's video today? You know, I do get pinged a few times like, hey, I haven't seen you on LinkedIn. I'm like, dude, I'm taking some time off. Leave me alone. <laughs> But so I think it's like letting go of that side of things, which I do think takes from introspection and, and, and time and just experience, but it's, it's, it's really letting go. It's saying, hey, it's okay to take a break. It's okay if this post didn't do well, we're going to get back on when it's time, when it's, when we're ready and we're going to learn and we're going to be better than ever. So the, I think the energy with that too, right. That you bring when you are a little bit more fresh and you did take some time is yes. It, critical to make sure that you have those energy reserves to put out content that is going to show that energy, especially if you're doing video. Yeah. Um, real very quick to wrap things up here, yeah. Alex, we got one last question and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap things up is generally you working with clients. It sounds like they already have teams or is a fresh start, like a viable company for someone to send a client to you. You said seven and eight figures. My assumption is that you're working with people that are already established here. Um, but for those that might know businesses that are in your target market, can you kind of give us an idea of like who, who is a great referral for you from anyone that's in the community that would love to make yeah. an introduction? Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, and, and to answer a question, sometimes they have teams and sometimes they don't. Right. So what I would say is the reason I say seven and eight figure is typically they have budget to afford the team. And by team, I mean, it could be just a video editor in the Philippines, right? Doesn't, I'm not saying like you need to hire a huge team W2s and all that stuff. They need to have the budget and the capacity to build infrastructure around content and video and this machine that we're going to build out. So if it's a solopreneur that's kind of getting started and they're just getting off the ground, obviously probably not the best client. I would push them to our video email series or our YouTube videos and things like that. But if you're a seven to eight figure business, and you're the founder, CEO of the company, and you raise your hand and you say, we want to be doing video in our business. And by the way, I want to lead the way. I want to become a key person of influence 
in my industry, which is what we're going to help you do. I want to leverage video as a 24 seven sales rep for the business. And I am a seven to figure seven, eight figure B2B company. That's our sweet spot. And people can find you through LinkedIn or what's the best way for folks to reach out and connect? Yeah, LinkedIn's great. Email uh, a Sheridan at impacts.com. Our website is impacts.com. I am as a Mary P's and Paul A X S. Dot com, but I'm, I'm really active on LinkedIn. So if you ping me there, I'll probably get back to you pretty quick. Thank you so much, Alex, and everyone here for the questions. Um, tons of knowledge and I really appreciate you kind of giving us some insight about what the back, the, the back, the back end of this all looks like and kind of your, your journey over the last four years. Um, greatly appreciate it. Um, one of Alex's best quotes we've got, give away your best content. That's so good <laughs> as others paid content. That's yeah, right. I, I love that Bruce. Yep. That's great. All right, Alex. Hey, everybody. We'll see you guys in the next videos. Um, appreciate you, Alex. Have a great Thanks, week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me.